Hey, it's Mazzy, and here are about a dozen albums that changed my life. Now, this is a direct influence and uh, borrow. Some would say theft, but no. This was influenced by Belinda Murphy, who in turn was influenced by Pete Pardo of uh, Sea of Tranquility. I did not watch his. Apparently, he showed 20 albums. Melinda showed 10 albums, and I'm showing about a dozen albums. Now, when I watched her video, what, what I loved about Melinda's video, and I'll put a link below uh, to that video, was how personal it was. And I think if you're going to do a, 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 a video like this, and you're going to do a response to something like this, you need to talk about what you were going through, the feelings you had, experiences you had, when these music, uh, these albums, these records came into your life. And uh, I see this as a, an extension or a greatest hits or best of, of my series I've been doing for the last five, six years of um, Memories of a Vinyl Junkie. But the condensed version, really kind of a, a best of, a comp version of that. Now, those of you who've been watching my channel for some time now will have heard probably a lot of these stories before. I don't think there's anything new, maybe a few uh, little additions and changes, but these are stories I've told in in some of those videos, depending on the year. Uh, the, there's a playlist above somewhere where it says playlist and go uh, into Memories of a Vinyl Junkie, and I really kind of showcase it, my life growing up in music and records I was into, what was happening, music I saw live, uh, my friends, uh, the loves, the losses, etc. So this is about a dozen. Going back to 1962, of course, in the late 50s or the mid 50s into the 1960s was the great folk music scare or the folk revival. Obviously, artists like Pete Seeger, the Weavers, uh, so many great artists. And there was the pop groups uh, the, and there was the um, the protest singers, too, into the 60s, into the whole Greenwich Village scene. A sort of a similar parallel thing was happening in the UK, but obviously my experience at this point is in the United States. And I remember it must have been third grade, second or third grade. Uh, we had those little record players and every day uh, in probably second grade or third grade, the teacher would play a record. And this record by the Limelighters. Now, uh, this is a folk trio, kind of came after the Kingston Trio. Uh, Glenn Yarborough uh, was one of the singers. This was uh, a children's folk record in a way. They played uh, in front of a live audience of kids. This is recorded at the Berkeley Community Theater, obviously across from San Francisco. The Berkeley Community Theater in the 70s uh, became, late 60s and the 70s, became an amazing uh, rock venue. Bill Graham put on a lot of shows there, as well as other uh, impresarios. Uh, Hendrix played there, and The Who played there, and uh, so I saw Cat Stevens there. I saw, I think I saw Neil Young there. I saw so many shows here. Bruce Springsteen. I saw a lot of shows at the Berkeley Community Theater. And I didn't realize, obviously, what this place was. But this is a, of children's songs, of folk songs, of the Limelighters, with children singing along. And uh, we play this every day. Songs like The Train, The Whale, Morning Ride, Join the Game, I Had a Mule, Lollipop Tree, America the Beautiful, and of course, ending with This Land is Your Land. Uh, didn't know who Woody Guthrie was, but we started to hear that song, especially in California. It was a song we heard all the time in grammar school. So this is sort of my uh, intro to folk music, and folk music was definitely the first music I fell in love with, aside from, you know, Disney songs on records, things like that, and Mickey Mouse songs. In terms of so-called serious music, it's got to be folk music, and this record was uh, very important in my life. Now, my father had one of those consoles. It was a high boy, not a low horizontal uh, console record player, FM radio type of thing. And the records that my parents got into the most, being the Jewish family we were, and I'm going to show a CD version of this because my buddy, my late buddy Larry, um, gave me this box set of Alan Sherman. This was a Rhino handmade box set. And the first album that uh, he put out and was a huge hit was Alan Sherman's My Son, the Folk Singer. Every Jewish family owned a copy of this record. This was one of the fastest selling records ever when this came out in 1962. Alan Sherman uh, 
Those of you of later generations may or may not know of Alan Sherman. He's basically uh, sort of invented what Weird Al Yankovic uh, does now with all his parody songs, taking original songs, taking melodies. Uh, later, he would do some uh, more classical melodies, mainly because of copyright. Some some songwriters, some publishers would allow him to use the songs. But my son, the folk singer, and they had a sort of a, a Jewish bent to them. But this was massive. I remember hearing this on the radio all the time. And in 1963 and 1964, my parents had my son, the folk singer, my son, the celebrity. And then in 1964, my son, the nut. This is the one. And this is the one that gave him a top 40 hit, a top 10 hit, I believe. Hello, Mudda, Hello, Fada. Here I am at Camp Granada. He recorded these. These are on Warner Brothers Records. He recorded these for live in a studio with a small audience. So you have, it's a, it's a comedy album. It's shtick, but it's hysterical. And during this time in 1963 and into, um, you know, mostly 63, I guess, um, I knew every lyric to almost every song. I would go in the living room and put this record on and it really changed my my knowledge of records and music and comedy and shtick. You know, this is sort of, it seemed like new shtick opposed to the old, like, Mil Milton Berle, Bob Hope shtick. It probably wasn't. It was still old timey. And, of course, all of a sudden, this is huge, the end of uh, 63, into 64. And, of course, in 1964, the record that literally changed my, my life overnight was Meet the Beatles. First, it was obviously I Want to Hold Your Hand, the single on Capitol Records, but everyone I know changed. I went from playing Little League, playing first ba base in Little League, wanting to, you know, play ball, to all of a sudden want to play rock and roll and faked it and 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 got a broomstick and just lip sync with my buddies to this album. Uh, this album, Introducing the Beatles, um, I probably got introducing around the same time, but this is the first one that came into my house, even though Introducing came out on VJ first. This changed everyone's life, good or bad, one way or another. What a great, and especially I want to hold your hand. I remember it was a Halloween, so it might have been late in 64. And it's with a series of my friends, so we were, what, just 10 years old. And he said, kept saying something. He kept saying, I blew bubblegum in my food. And walk right in, sit right down, baby, let your hang, hair hang down, uh, that, that folk song. But I put bubblegum in my food, I thought was the funniest thing. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And then a few days later, I went to his house, and he had an older sister. And it's the first time I heard what he was talking about. And he put on this record. Uh, this is another side of Bob Dylan. And the song uh, referring to that came on, and I didn't know, any, I didn't know who Bob Dylan was. We weren't reading uh, articles on Bob Dylan when you're 10 years old. I had no idea who Bob Dylan was. And I just thought his voice was strange, but 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 interesting. I really was attracted, almost like a, a character voice in a way. But that song, I Shall Be Free, number 10, that's the one where he says that at one point, bubblegum in my food. And I thought the lyrics, that kind of talking folk thing was the coolest thing. Now, I didn't buy this record for a number of years. I don't think um, my first two Dylan records were Blonde on Blonde and then The Greatest Hits uh, with the Milton Glaser poster. But this record influenced me because I really was interested. But for whatever reason, I didn't say, Mom, I want a Bob Dylan album. I'm really curious what, what they would have thought of his music because it wasn't the mainstream. It was really the Peter, Paul and Mary stuff that brought Bob Dylan songs uh, to uh, the masses, really, initially. And then, of course, in 1965, The Birds with Mr. Tambourine Man. So Dylan really didn't popularize his songs, but um, uh, it was the cover versions uh, that really made it initially for Bob Dylan. But this is a, an important record. Now, doing this, this video, there's so many ways you can go. When you say records that really changed my life, are we talking about your life as a human as a person, emotionally, romantically, or you talk about your musical life and your journey. I think it, it overlaps, at least in my life, it overlaps. The next one I want to do is uh, early 1967, and uh, this is Strawberry Fields Forever, Back with Penny Lane, the single, single on this. I remember, I can still remember the first time I heard this. I had 
I think it was either for Christmas before or birthday, I got a like a AM FM clock radio. And FM was just kind of starting. Underground FM in San Francisco, KMPX. Tom Donahue came from KYA Radio. He's the granddaddy, the grandfather of uh, underground radio, freeform radio. It started in San Francisco with KMPX. There was a strike. It merged to KSAN, and of course, it swept the country uh, eventually uh, with FM radio and rock radio. At first, you, you know, no one had those FM radio bands unless you had an old console or something, uh, and cars certainly didn't have FM radio in those days. But one night, I had that clock radio, which wasn't just a transistor, so it had a little more bass. It was about so big, yay big. That's what we used to say so is yay, yay big at the time. Horizontal, I think it was a Magnavox, but it had a really nice tone to it, a really warmth that you didn't have on a little transistor radio because the speaker was bigger. And and it was right above my bed. I had like a, um, a little kind of higher table next to me. So it was just above my hearing every night. And it was a clock radio type thing. So I could set the timer for it to go off. And so every night I'd put that on and play music. And I usually fell asleep before it went off. But one night, I first heard Strawberry Fields Forever, this song, for the Beatles. Of course, we hadn't heard the Beatles since 1966, it's Revolver, and this was so different. I remember that eerie Mellotron intro, that keyboard intro. I didn't know what that was. Let me take you down, I'm going to, that kind of slowed down John Lennon voice. And I remember it was the first time, and I can remember this so vividly, it was the first time I ever thought about death. Like that someday I'm going to die, that I'm not going to live forever. Now, I don't know why this song <laughs> triggered that. It was bizarre. Uh, I thought, and I remember hearing rumors that, oh, Strawberry Fields was this cemetery in Liverpool. Well, it turns out that was not true. It turned out to be an orphanage. But I that must have been something I heard after the fact. But I remember kind of being scared, but not like spooky scared. It was just a weird thing about mortality. And that the first time, I thought about um, death. Hopefully it wouldn't come for a long time, which is a good thing. But I thought about the thing that we don't live forever. And this was, you know, me at, you know, 11 and a half years old, 12 years old almost. Actually 12 years old, 12 and a half years old. But uh, the Beatles on that. And of course, in June, Sgt. Pepper. This record changed a lot of lives as well. The day it came out at the record store, I remember waiting there and the guy had a box of records and opened it up and he just started handing out to people and it just happened to be a stereo and that's why i'm so in love with the stereo the american version i'm fine with it i play this record all the time this blew my mind but sitting at that dinner table at my friend's house in woodside i remember the his father john my friend's name was tom pulled out a time magazine with that kind of uh, puppet illustration of the Beatles and started reading an article on Sgt. Pepper. I guess it was a review and I have that magazine in my collection somewhere now. But I remember him reading that and talk. And this is really when pop rock criticism began because of this album. Everyone didn't take it seriously like that. There was no rock critics back then. There was music critics and, you know, classical music, jazz artists, but no music critic. This pretty much single-handedly invented rock criticism. And I remember my friend Tom's father reading that article. I, and we had an, a cool discussion at 13 years old. We had a cool discussion of Beatles and the art. And we brought out the cover and looked at the cover. Uh, you all know this album. You can't imagine how different this album was. It's like people say now, okay, Sergeant Pepper, what's the big deal? At that time, this was the biggest friggin' deal ever uh this nothing was like this it was light years beyond anything else that came out and th so again another record that changed my life and i started really diving into you know some say this is not psychedelic compared to a lot and it's not in in the what we call psychedelic now but this is an art piece from the artwork on the cover the peter blake michael cooper photograph um to the lyrics on the back the first time and the cut now to 1969 there was a, uh, a record store in the Stonestown Mall near San Francisco State College that I used to go in occasionally. I used to take the little the bus there and the streetcar there. And there was a guy there, and I really didn't know his name and everything. And it turned out 
One day I went in and I picked up this album, Tommy. So this is 1969. And the guy said, oh God, that's the best album I've ever heard. You need to go see them. They're playing like in two or three weeks at the Fillmore West. Now, up to this point, I'd never been to the Fillmore West. I was 15 years old. I ended up buying a ticket. I think they had tickets they sold there and I bought a couple of tickets and my buddy um, and I went to see uh, The Who at the Fillmore West and they performed the entire Tommy. Of course, Live at Leeds is around that time, probably recorded before uh, they came to the States. This record blew me away. Ironically, the guy that sold me the ticket was a guy named Roy Loney, who I didn't realize, who was just starting or in a band called the Flaming Groovies. Um, I didn't know who the Flaming Groovies were. I, I saw their name because I would get these Fillmore and Avalon handbills. I didn't know at the time. I didn't make the connection. But as I went back to the record store all the time, uh, Roy would turn me on to records. And another kind of coincidence, 10 years later, 1978, um, I would work with Roy at ABC Records. He worked in promotion and I worked with him for about two years and knew him after that. Of course, then he uh, came back into music, Roy Loney and the Phantom Movers. But I digress, which I usually do. This record to me is one of the best Who records. This and Who Sell Out to me are my favorite. I think this is far superior than Quadrophenia. I get Quadrophenia. I think it's a little bloated. This sounds better. This has a great... Uh, the acoustic guitars, the arrangements on here. Um, just Kit Lambert, uh, who produced this with uh, Pete Townsend, just did an incredible job. I absolutely love this record. This was like also like nothing I'd never heard. It's not really the first rock opera. You know, it, it was SF Sorrow by The Pretty Things, the first one. It doesn't matter who's first. This was a major accomplishment, like two years earlier, Sgt. Pepper. It's, it was that important in my mind. And seeing The Who going to the Fillmore West the first time just blew my friggin' mind. We were, my buddies and I were going to Golden Gate Park, seeing free shows in the park. But I finally, in 1969, started paying and seeing shows inside in a concert venue. And that really changed my whole life. And being in San Francisco, I started seeing all these shows. Uh, the next one I want to show or two records I'm combining together for, you'll see why. Live Dead, uh, which came out uh, towards, I guess, November of 1969. And Bless This Point Little Ahead in the middle or probably May or June of 1969. A reason I show these together is in November 69, my buddies and I again rode our bikes to Golden Gate Park at and saw these two bands at the Polo Fields, which is on the um, west side of the park. And it was one of the most incredible shows ever. This is Live Dead, the very first full Grateful Dead proper live album. They had live things on albums sort of mixed up within it. But this is the first one. What a great spacey album. But this is one of the greatest live albums of the San Francisco bands in the 60s. Buses Point Little Head, Jefferson Airplane. This is recorded Fillmore East in 68. Uh, there's uh, Jack Cassidy. This is at the Jefferson Airplane Mansion on Fulton, 2400 Fulton Street. This is an incredible sounding record. Jack Cassidy's bass playing. Of course, everything has expanded. At this time, from 67, 8, and 9, Jefferson Airplane were the best live album. I saw them several times, and they were the best live album. Of course, I like The Dead. They were still noodling and doing cool stuff, and they, I think, became a, a better live band as they grew. Of course, they were great at this point, but there was a tightness here that The Dead didn't have. It was just different. Um, you know, yin and yang, you know, chocolate or vanilla, it doesn't really matter. But seeing both these outside at a free concert in Golden Gate Park, that's why I had to show these. And those shows, uh, those live shows in Golden Gate Park really, you know, said a lot and meant a lot to me. Of course, around that time, I would see also Altamont, and, and which was a bizarre thing. And the Dead wouldn't play. And uh, the Jefferson Airplane were there. And Santana was there. And Flying Burrito Brothers. But... Uh, that is a different thing. Like I, I thought about events that are important that changed my life over records, but I think records have to be the focal point here. And these two records were pretty important. Another story I know I've told, Art Garfunkel's first solo album, Angel Claire. Of course, this came out, I think this came out in 1973. 
but it was recorded in San Francisco Columbia Studios in 1972. My girlfriend and I, Judy, had gone to a movie theater, the Alexandria Theater on Geary and 18th Avenue out in the Richmond District of San Francisco. I have a Pinto. I have a brown Pinto then. The side window had a McGovern Shriver sticker. I was turning 18. I turned 18 that summer. And so I worked for George McGovern. I uh, voted for George McGovern. Uh, he only won one state uh, that election. But in the late summer, I was with Judy in the car. We were in the car and it was parked on the corner. And I look out my window and Art Garfunkel standing across the street in the corner. And he's like, he's, I'm staring at him. He's staring at me just across a, a small street. And he starts walking to the car and he says, why are you for George McGovern? And if you look back on history, Simon and Garfunkel did a, a benefit concert in New York or in the East Coast for McGovern around that time. It was like a their first reunion since they're split up. And they played um, some tracks, some songs there. But um, I don't remember what I said. <laughs> I was gobsmacked. Um, Judy was in the front seat looking beautiful. Beautiful girlfriend I had. Um, and I said, do you want to ride? And he said, sure. He gets in the back. It's a two door. He gets in the back. And I said, where are you going? He goes, uh, I'm going to Chinatown. Can you give me a lift? So I, we go down Gary Boulevard towards Chinatown. In the back a seat, at one point he says, do you mind if I smoke? And I, and I, I don't care because our Garfunkel. He smokes a joint. He left it in the little ashtray. Pinto's had a little ashtray in the back uh, right in the molded plastic. And for literally years, I had that roach I kept uh, in a paper plastic bag. It's, it'll probably turn up between some record or magazine. Uh, but we, and then he said, do you know any good Chinese restaurants in Chinatown? I said, yeah, my parents used to take me to a place. So Art Garfunkel took Judy and I to dinner. We spent about three hours together talking. And I remember him talking about him and Paul how when they were first singing, looking at each other's lips and their tongues, where the notes were when they would sing and try to get those harmonies right. He was talking about this perfectionist uh, sound they really strive for. And then he kept asking us, like, are you two in love? Or do you think you'll get married sometime? And and I was just barely 18. Judy was a year older than me, 19. And uh, I don't even remember what we said. Turns out six months later, he's he got married. So he was, I know this stuff was going through his head, but uh, at the end of the uh, dinner, he goes, can you give me a lift one more place? And we brought him to Union Street, where he went to the midnight show at the Metro Theater of The Candidate with Robert Redford. Um, so that was, I mean, again, not so much meeting a famous person, but spending probably three and a half hours with him talking about art and creativity and work ethic and what he was working on. He had done, what, Catch-22 and carnal knowledge in films at the time. And this record would come out. I think this is a, it's, it's a personal record for me because it's a beautiful record recorded in San Francisco at, at Columbia and at Grace Cathedral. It's got a haunting melodic sound. Uh, Jerry Garcia's on it. Uh, the uh, boys choir from Grace Cathedral. Uh, just a lot of uh, beautiful thing. Tommy Tedesco, Julius Broussard, uh, Carl Radel. Uh, Paul Simon plays on a little bit of, but J.J. Kale, uh, Milt Holland, uh, but it's it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful record. There's a Van Morrison cover on here as well too. Next, you're, if you know the story, if you've heard this before, I'll be quick. Pink Floyd, Echoes, Metal, excuse me, but Echoes, the long track on side two, the entire side. My parents were away for the weekend. My girlfriend came over. I had a, a component system at this point but my turntable still had a stacking, the stack spindle. And I stacked five records. All I remember, the only two I remember is this and Abbey Road, side two of Abbey Road was on there. And it was a, it, we basically lost our virginity to Echoes. That's the record that dropped, literally. That's all I'll say about that. But this is an important record. I think it's one of the best Pink Floyd records, but it obviously means a lot. It literally changed my life, like in six seconds, two minutes, 10 minutes. 14 minutes. How long does that go? 20 minutes? There you go. 1975, uh, working in the record store. One of the guys who worked with, had gone to New York and he came back and he opened up this record, Patti Smith Horses. And oh my God, this was really different than the, 
you know, the, you know, the friggin' Eagles and Peter Frampton and Fleetwood Mac and obviously before Rumors, but um, I think, I can't remember if the first self-titled Buckingham Knicks out, but this was, this had balls, this was sexy, this was in your face, Gloria, produced by John Cale. This changed my musical taste and I started getting away from that boring prog ass shit I was into also. And uh, obviously uh, two years earlier, that whole yes, not yes songs, but Tales from a Topographic kind of blew it for me for prog for a while. But this was so good. This was immediate. Of course, next the year after this are Ramones and the punk scene. Um, I listened to a lot of punk and uh, my friend Jashid Brooks and I would go to punk shows all the time at the Mabue at the Deaf Club and um, a number of the Brazilian. And I, there was a bunch of clubs and uh, temporary venues in San Francisco. We go see everyone and almost every weekend or even during the week, uh, working in record stores, going to college, going to see shows all late at night till two or in the morning, uh, fantastic. So this really changed my musical taste and musical direction, but added to it. I didn't throw things away. It wasn't like, this is the new trendy thing. I'm not going to listen to Emmylou Harris or Graham Parsons anymore. I'm going to end up, and of course, there's decades beyond this, but this is like the foundation. These years when you're in your teens and 20s really are the foundation uh, for your musical journey. Now, obviously, it changes. People get into jazz or they get into, um, and that's even another direction, my, fat, my jazz journey. But in 1978 was my first trip to uh, England and Europe. After I got out of college and when I got in, I, I think it was like March or April, I arrived in London. I mean, you can look on the charts and I can probably figure it out closely. But my friend picked me up at Heathrow and he turns on the radio and the first song that's playing is Wuthering Heights by Kate Bush. What the fuck is this? I thought this was, I smiled, I laughed. I thought this was the coolest friggin' thing. Uh, the next day I went up to Oxford Street, I think it was HMV on Oxford Street, and I bought this this exact single back with Kite. I don't remember even originally listening to Kite. Of course, uh, this is the album. I didn't get the album until I got back in the States uh, several months later. Uh, but Wuthering Heights changed things for me. Going to England was a big deal. It was my first trip to Europe. The only time I've been out of the country by that time was one trip to Mexico and Israel in 1970 with my confirmation class. But I kept hearing this song. And um, by that time, too, I remember all of a sudden hearing Because the Night echoing from cliffs off of the uh, uh, discos in Greece and the beaches, th that kind of song as well. But this really changed it for me. And I was all in and fell in love with Kate Bush, incredible artist. But hearing uh, that song, Wuthering Heights, was uh, just a whole different thing. So. A little bit of an autobiographical, um, my journey through music, songs and music that changed my life, records that changed my life. Thanks, Melinda. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Pardo. I didn't watch yours, but uh, I guess you got this one going. And uh, let's see who else comes up with this. Mazzy loves you. Take care.